My name's Tom. I'm one of the founders and creative directors of Flying Object. Uh, I'm not an artist. I'm one of the few people speaking today who's not an artist, possibly the only one. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit today about an experience we designed, an sort of exhibition we built at Tate to surround art with multi-sensory exhibition and experience design. Um, and that was called Tate Sensorium. So the idea behind Tate Sensorium was there's been a growing trend of multi-sensory design over the last few years. And the sort of easiest way to think about this is in the restaurant world. If you think about someone like Heston Blumenthal, his entire restaurant space is designed for all the senses from the minute that you walk in to the minute that you leave. The weight of the cutlery, the color of the tablecloth, the sound that you hear, the music, the way that people talk, it's all designed to um, create a sort of deeper sense and deeper engagement with the food and a better sense of taste. So we thought, can we take that, that kind of idea, and create a deeper sense of engagement with artworks, and these are very old school artworks, these are paintings on canvas, um, in a gallery like Tate Britain. Um, what it sort of looked like, I'm, I'm afraid I can't really like reproduce it because it was a whole mess of wires and we had to build walls and things like that, is four rooms which you walk through, which each had a sensory landscape built into it around a piece of art from Tate's 20th century collection of British painting. So the first one from Richard Hamilton, there were things that you could smell and hear. Uh, the second one, John Latham, there was a haptic experience as well as sound and so on. If I break one of those down, it sort of looks like this. This is the final artwork that you saw. It's Francis Bacon, figure in landscape. It's from 1945. Um, it's a really interesting painting because what you can see is there's a big black spot in the middle, and Bacon, at the end of painting this character, which is actually his agent slash lover, um, he kind of like got the black paint out, and he really aggressively went on the canvas for this. He also picked up dust from his floor, and he threw it at the canvas, and you can still see some of it there. So we designed a lot of the sensory um, kind of cues that we put around this in order to bring out some of this information within the painting. But we also designed some of it to sort of just cue up kind of weird thoughts in your head or bring out old memories, which might help you personally engage with the painting in more of a deeper way. So the main thing that we built for this one was a chocolate. We worked with a chocolatier. It was actually a sort of chocolate shell full of a kind of dry dust. And you couldn't tell it was a dry dust, which surprised people a lot. And that dry dust was made out of chocolate, dark chocolate, ch um, charcoal, which is obviously a reference to the black, um, burnt orange, because there's actually kind of orange flowers in the painting that you only really notice later. Um, salt and lapsang souchong, which is a smoked tea. Uh, we like the idea of smoke and tea because the painting was painted in 1945. Uh, as so it's the end of the Second World War, it kind of sort of seems like to connote quite well with that. In terms of a haptic sensation, that was the touch, that was what you're getting in the mouth. As I said, it was the sort of dry dust. Um, it was surprising, it was unusual, it kind of quite unpleasant. But then what happened is the chocolate melted and suddenly it became really quite nice, which uh, again kind of relates to your relationship with the painting. After a while, you notice there's a blue sky. There is some optimism in there. In terms of sound, we use a bit of binaural recording of Hyde Park, which is where the painting is situated, and also added in kind of samples around wool. He's wearing a woolly suit, the iron chair, and it kind of went from the iron chair into kind of machines. And then we filled the whole space with a horse-like smell, because in 1945, Hyde Park would have been full of horses. We used some kind of interesting technologies as well along the way. Um, Ultra Haptics, anyone's actually seen this, is a sort of programmable touch device. It uses ultrasound interference patterns to create patterns of touch on your hand, a little bit like air being pushed into your hand in sort of unusual ways. We paired that with sound for a sort of maximum effect, uh, stuck it in a box, put a green light in the box. People found it really surprising until you got to about 60, at which point people couldn't notice it at all. That was a really interesting finding for us. Uh, we also used directional speakers. This allowed us to create different planes of sound. So at the back of the room for a painting by David Bomberg, you could hear one thing, but at the front of the room, you could hear something completely different. That was a sort of really interesting experience for us. Uh, and we also used motion-activated scent devices as well. But the other sort of main piece of technology that I want to talk about was a sensor that we gave to people. And this is Today is mostly about sensors, but sensors are actually kind of a really interesting part of this as well, and it was an EDA sensor. So what it does is it records the electrodermal activity of your skin. That is, some people might know this as skin conductance response. It's kind of a, the amount of sweat that your skin is giving off, and it's a measure of your autonomous nervous system. It's what's happening without your brain really thinking. So this is what goes into a lie detector, 
Uh, it's triggered by fear, by laughing, by kind of those sudden reactions. And we took that and we get, put it on people and we tracked their tour around the space, which was always the same, the amount of time you spent in each one. And at the end, we kind of gave that data back to you in, in the form of a graph. Um, and then we related that to the paintings that you saw. And people really kind of engaged with this. They found it really interesting. They took pictures of it. They put them on Twitter. It's basically a picture of your sweat, but they were still sharing that, which we thought was kind of interesting. Um, we got a lot of press for it. I'm not saying this to show off. I think one of the interesting things, if anyone here works in the sort of, um, in the world of arts, and you're looking at trying to get visitors through your door, is that this is a trend which is interesting right now for people. Uh, sort of experience of the world is so digitally moderated now that if we start thinking about how to bring the senses back into your experience, people are really interested in that. They're really interested in those kind of one-of-a-kind senses that can only happen in a space. And a lot of the artworks here at Striper very much like that. People really are interested in something unusual which they can't get through a screen. The other thing we thought was quite of cool was how the journalists like to play off the idea of Tate as an august, old institution playing around with experimental, new, interesting technologies. Uh, for the next section, I just want to talk a little bit about how we kind of brought this together and some learnings. This is going to get a bit production focused, but some people might like this, some people might find it kind of boring. Um, the important thing was we, as Flying Object, don't know anything about <laughs> multi-sensory design or exhibition design. We've never really done it before. So we do what we always do, which is bring together a team of specialists to work with. So we had a sound designer, a fragrance specialist, a chocolatier, scientist, theater maker, lighting designer, developers, and someone from Tate themselves, and kind of created this sort of massive group of people. And through that, through a collaborative process, able to develop the kind of the insights, the stimuli, the design, the whole thing came out of that. It was very much a kind of design thinking process and along the lines of idea, if anyone's familiar with that, where you try something out, you prototype it. We were standing in the gallery, smelling things and hoping that no one noticed, looking at paintings, trying to figure out what worked for us, and then built it up from there. Very experimental. A few things we learned. Um, as I mentioned before, people love experiences. They love these kind of suddenly past your screen. But they also love talking about experiences. We got a lot more people talking about this on social media than actually went to the exhibition. In the end, we could only limit 4,000 tickets to the exhibition, but there was a lot more sort of discussion about this on social media, which was kind of exciting. And I think hopefully could lead to some interesting stuff happening in the future. Another thing we learned is that how do I put this? A lot of the reviews we got were quite negative from sort of art critics because they felt that we were taking paintings which had no sensory sort of a landscape around them and interrupting that relationship you have with a painting. But actually, that's not true. When you walk into a 300-year-old building, you're told not to eat anything. You're told not to speak very loudly. You can hear your footsteps bouncing around this marble. That is a very clear sensory landscape as far as I'm concerned. That is telling you all the things that that institution wants you to know about the artwork that's contained within it. All we were doing is changing that. We are making it dark, we are making it loud, we are making it smelly. And I think this kind of sense that whatever you're designing that is going to be in this, into a sensory landscape which pre-exists is something that we're really interested in. How can we subvert that? How can we change that? Uh, how we can play around with those expectations? And then the third thing is this power of giving that sense of data back to the people, like I was saying on the wristbands. Um, people are kind of interested in this, and we have so many sensors, Tobias was talking about this earlier, we have so many sensors around us all the time at the moment, but we have no real transparency as to what they're doing, um, the data that they're recording, or how can we you can use that. Even though the graph of data was really kind of unreadable for most people, they'd never heard of the metric that we were using, they still use it as a filter to go back through the exhibition they just seen, look at the spikes, look at the flat bits, and start bringing their own interpretation to this. And I thought that was really interesting. It kind of gave you a way of re remembering what had just happened on a minute by minute level. Uh, if you're in a production focused organization like mine, you often ask people, well, what was the really hard thing that you did and what was the really easy thing that you did? The really hard thing we did for this was installation. Um, if you ever think about doing this thing, this kind of thing, in a really old building, these buildings are not built for the hundreds of cables that you need to plug into hundreds of different bits of audio hardware. That was a real pain. We finished building it the minute that the journalists turned up outside the door. We were still screwing stuff down to the ground with three national newspapers from the UK standing outside the front door. I don't want that to ever happen again. Um, but the easy bit was working with Tate. Surprisingly enough, they were really chilled out about us <laughs> taking these paintings, um, which are worth who knows what, um, and putting them into a space and surrounding them with smells and things like that. 
um, they were really chilled out. So that was, that was a nice kind of to work with an organization which is so open to its own collection and so open to us kind of interrupting its gallery space. So I've got about five minutes left, and I'm going to just go through a few other things that we as an organization are interested in. We did take Sensorium in late 2015. Since then, a lot of the technologies have evolved, a lot of other things have come into play. And as we think about multisensory design now, I just wanted to give you guys some sort of thought starters, some inspiration, which you can maybe take away and put into practice yourself. So the first one is the importance of audio playback. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw this. It's the encounter by Complicite. It's one of the most extraordinary pieces of theater I've ever seen. A lot of it is done, it's all done by Simon McBurney, this guy, on stage for two hours, shouting. He uses a binaural headset. Um, so he's talking into this binaural head in kind of real time. He's also got other speakers, uh, sorry, other microphones, as well as speakers, and everyone's wearing headphones. And I think the interesting thing about this is you're in a theater, and yet you're wearing headphones, and yet there's a man shouting, and yet there are subwoofers everywhere, creates three different le levels of audio playback. And actually, the binaural head wasn't even super important here. These levels of audio playback all gave you very, very different kind of connections with what was essentially a man on stage. We think a lot about how we record audio nowadays. We think a lot less about how we play back audio. In Tate Sensorium, we use four different audio mechanisms, and we often layer them on, on, on top of each other. Big subwoofers create a physical sense within your heart in a way that headphones just can't do. So when you're thinking about audio, think about how you're playing back and how you can make that big. Our second one is about making computers dramatic. So this is a project we did at Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, they wanted to use a piece of Intel technology around a play, which Intel was sponsoring, um, which captured uh, gestures. And the play was a tempest. So we said, OK, what if we could capture your gestures <clears throat> in a way that you could create the storm from the tempest? So rather than having a kind of interface with a computer which is very kind of tiny, or which is typing, or which is unknown because it's reading things off you which you're not even understanding, what if you could actually really sort of swing your arms around like this and get very dramatic? It feels very theatrical and it's really fun. It also connects something really physical with computing, which is normally very cerebral. And this was kind of a, ends up being kind of a game, a three minute long game, everyone loved it, but it's kind of interesting to sort of see how can we break down these standards of interface design and really put things into people in a way that they can, they can engage with computers in a whole different way. The third is touch. I think touch is, touch is interesting because we're very much, this is obviously Apple and Force Touch, we're very much at the sort of beginning of a new language around touch. Um, we haven't really been able to touch computers and have them feed back to us for very long. But Apple is beginning to kind of edge there. We now have increasing technologies like the ultra haptics one that I was talking about earlier. Gesture control can now be fed back via that kind of technology. What is the language of touch which will allow us to have this much more physical and much more intense connection with a computing device than just sort of eyes? I think touch is it kind of like it's a sense which touches, <laughs> a sense which connects to you in a much more physical and intricate way. Uh, whereas eyes is a much more kind of rational connection, visual is much more rational. So how can we kind of develop that language in a way which kind of asks questions of how we design computers, maybe takes the computers out of your vision entirely, but still allows you to be fed back by them. Another thing we're really interested in is taking an existing behavior and then using a little bit of technology to subvert that. This is a project we did with the Old Vic in London, which is another big theater. Um, they had a community um, production, so that's a production put on by people who live near the theater who aren't professionals. And the whole thing was about London and the networks within London. So you can be living next to somebody who is of a different religion, who hangs out in a different place, who talks to different people and has different concerns. You can be living in the same house as them, but you might not have any kind of connection with that whatsoever because all the networks are stratified. We thought, what if we use something like a phone, which is such a sort of, you know, you know how to use it, it's a payphone kind of device. But we use that to sort of tap in between those networks. So we got members of the community company to record answer phone messages to someone that they really wanted to apologize to or have a go at or pledge a love to or something like that. And then we put those answer phone messages into these payphones and they would ring. And you go up to them because it's ringing, you know exactly what you've got to do, and then suddenly you're in somebody else's world. And it's a really nice way of kind of cutting through a barrier and presenting someone with something which they normally wouldn't really engage with, which is the people living around them. 
And the last one I want to talk about, and this has come up a little bit before, uh, is machine learning. Has anyone seen this? This went big on the internet for about three hours last week. Um, <laughs> it's called Edges to Cats, and it uses TensorFlow, uh, sort of Google's open source machine learning software, to find the edges of your drawing and then fill it with cat. Cats are very much a the theme of today. I, I'm all for that. Um, they also do shoes. <laughs> That's of interest to anyone. I drew this yesterday. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can think it's really a kind of accurate representation of a cat. Machine learning is very interesting. And obviously, Tobias spoke to this much more kind of intelligently than I will today. But what I'm interested in is how can we take a technology which is fundamentally going to change the world, way that the world goes round, fundamentally going to change the way that employment works, how health works, how almost anything works, and bring it to people in a way which they can understand what's actually going on. They didn't need to understand what a neural network is, or how it works, or what, a, what the nodes are, or anything like that. They need to have some kind of sense of what this technology is and how it's going to come into our lives. A couple of other examples of this, there's um, a nice one by Google called AI Duet. You play a couple of notes on a keyboard, and the duet sort of feeds back to you by playing its own notes on the keyboard as well. That's quite nice because, again, it's sort of a non-visual, it's sort of a sensory action. But it's using the senses to sort of talk about something which is really hard to otherwise understand. Um, so yeah, so it'd be interesting to see how we can kind of take something like machine learning forward and bring it into a sensory landscape. Um, that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, but I've got, I think, a couple of minutes for questions if anyone has some. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions. Here's Yip and here's Johanna. Please stick up your hand if you have a question. And as we continue with the subject of smell, I was wondering, because um, with the paintings that you used in this state sensorium, all the painters are dead, mm -hmm. but still they might be knocking on their coffin and going, hey, what do you mean smell like a horse? It should be herring and sweat or something like that. <laughs> I mean, they could really disagree on that. How do you find out what, you know, what smell to use with what? Yes, I mean, there's a, <clears throat> there's a big question here. Is like, at what point does the piece of art become, the, leave the artist's kind of possession and kind of go into the institution yeah. and for them to control and things like that? We tried to bed everything that we did into something data-based. Yeah. So it could be around the time that it was created, the mechanism with which it was created with, that kind of thing, what they were trying to do, the title. So we tried to make sure that every interpretation we made was based in something real. Yeah. And then the artist that we worked with kind of be, got creative on top of that. So we weren't totally kind of sweeping in and ignoring all the uh, yeah. kind of in incentives of the, of the artist. We were hoping to sort of build on top of that. Would they all like it? I'm not sure. Would you, would you actually <laughs> be interested in input of people? Could we all vote for what Guernica of Picasso would smell like? Or There was an earlier idea which was to try and do some kind of feedback loop like that. Yeah. I think that would be a lovely sort of thing to move on to next. I think one of the things we wanted to do with Tate and Sorin was just like to ask a bunch of questions and see what people thought about it. Yeah. Some people liked some things, some people didn't like other things. But I'd love to see other art institutions, galleries pick this up and say, well, well let's take this and then let's make it interactive. Well, let's take this and let's feed back through our visitors in the way they And the data about. went to the University of Sussex. Did anything come out of it yet or what? So the guys who are working with Sussex are studying haptic um, sort of relationships with computers, human computer interactions through haptic devices. So they wrote a very in-depth, very long paper about the machine which tracks bits of your hand, which got presented at a very academic conference about it. Um, but it is interesting. You cannot say that in a few lines here. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to basically work out, like, what would a bad text message feel like? Which I think is an interesting question to sort of try and address. <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh -huh. Is there any questions in the audience? Uh, stick up your hand. Uh, yeah, in the back. You. Yip is running all the way. Uh, Coming to you. Yeah, hi, thank you. I was wondering, um, it seems that in the terms of the experience, you very much try to honor the, the experience of the artwork itself. Um, did you also consider to be more curatorial? So rather than enhancing what's already there, maybe do something that undermines the experience or highlights some tensions that are inside the artworks? And did you have any experiences with that? Yes, we, we had some really interesting conversations with Tate about this, and I think fundamentally we wanted to make sure that we weren't, we weren't going to drag them into any trouble. <laughs> I think maybe we had to do the first version, which is, as you kind of put it, sort of sounds a little bit safer by honoring the artwork before we can push it a little bit further forward. Um, we also discussed using works by living artists and what that could get us into. Um, at the time, Howard Hodgkin was alive, and we were considering using one of his pieces, which, as far as he's concerned, once he's painted it, it's somebody else's problem. And it would have been really interesting to try and 
try and kind of argue against it or push back and forth against something like that. Um, and then I, I, have, uh, I have one thing because with the, um, I remember now that I think of it, there was a Rothko um, exhibition in Tate as well, I think it was almost 10 years ago, where you could actually on an iPod listen to the music he was listening to when he was painting. You could choose that to do or not. Is that also what you're interested in, that people can choose themselves how, whether they want to do it, whether not, whether they want s strange or different ways or like more into the painting, what you think or? Yeah, I think, I think one way I can see this going forward is you take the sort of the amount of stuff that we put into a tiny room and put it over a massive room. So you have some paintings which are surrounded by nothing, but maybe you do have a room which has got a certain scent in it. Maybe you do have a room which has got a string quartet playing in the middle of it. Or you use kind of location awareness so that when you move into a room, your kind of like headphones change and things like that. There's, there's a lot of ways we can use technology to kind of bring these gentle nudges yeah. into play and get people away from reading those tiny little cards by paintings. Because you go to an exhibition nowadays and everyone's looking at the cards when there's an enormous painting here. And the senses give us a way to kind of break out of that and just focus people on work and just use sort of sound and smell and things like that just to nudge people in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We need to continue, but you're here. So if you have any more further questions, go to Tom Percy. Thank cool. you. Thank you.